Nobody was there to record this very a moment when I just learned how to play chess, watching my parents trying to solve problems. You know, that was um, a great moment because I was very lucky that I discovered chess at such an early age, around six, and the rest was almost automatic. So I, uh, I knew the game was for me like a match made in heaven. I uh, climbed uh, at this chess uh, stairs very quickly and uh, by age 10, everybody knew that I would have a great chess future. I uh, worked very hard. I knew that, you know, the hard work was an important ingredient of, of uh, being successful. My mother always wanted me just to, to be a balanced boy, and I, I read a lot of books, you know, played with other kids. I uh, had... Uh, uh, one day that I, you know, just on Sunday, that's uh, where I could go to the special, you know, chess section in the Pioneer Palace in Baku. But I, I never ceased, you know, sort of exploring the game of chess. So that's when I had a chance, you know, I could look at, the, at some books, you know, and, and it, you know, it, it was a very steady grow, a growth uh, of my knowledge of chess, you know, my chess strengths and. Uh, and at one point, you know, probably it kind of was age 10, so I became, you know, 9 or 10. So I became more engaged, you know, just adding hours into my preparation. Uh, but it was n never, you know, too excessive. Uh, as you know, you have to do this, you have to spend hours. It's, you know, my mother believed, and she was absolutely right, that, you know, that this progress had to be natural. I became the youngest world champion, you know, 30 years ago, just at age 22. And uh, I think the fact that I became world champion at age 22, I mean, just tells a lot. And uh, what I was ready to bear the, the, the pressure of, psychological pressure of this title, and there's this responsibility, it's another story, but, um, you know, I, I find no reason to, to, to complain about this achievement. I knew that, you know, I always had a challenge because I wanted not just to win the game, not to win the match, but to make the difference. And if you want to make the difference, it, may, it means you always are looking for something new. You're always looking for an opportunity to sort of push the horizon, which means you're fighting, you know, your own excellence. Um, uh, so it's, it's like playing yourself because you did something, you know, and, and it helped you to win. But if you want to improve, uh, and to make a difference next day, you just have to go beyond that, which was the main reason why I could stay afloat. Actually, I stay on the top for so long because my opponents always had to deal with something new, so they, they never could uh, uh, catch me, you know, by doing something uh, old-fashioned. I had many great opponents, but naturally, you know, I spent more, more time at the chessboard with Anatoly Karpu and with Anna as a chess player. So we played five World Championship matches yeah, from 1984 to 1990, not counting uh, uh, many games, uh, official and unofficial games uh, in uh, classical or, 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 in, or in rapid time controls. It was just great learning experience uh, because Karpov's style was very different from mine and uh, he could do many things much better than I could because, you know, it was, you know, very quiet positional player, you know, who could uh, make long-term long plans, you know, and just to find a way to get maximum effects or out of the minimum resources that he could uh, rally at the board while I played more aggressive chess, more dynamic. So playing with him so many games definitely, you know, uh, helped me to become you know, more universal, you know, like, you know, when you have to polish the diamond. So that's why Karpov's, uh, Karpov, um, games with Karpov, they always uh, uh, help me to uh, advance my own my own uh, chess style, improve my own chess style, and uh, to advance as the as the chess player who could uh, uh, master different kind of situations at the board. I always look for new challenges, and when I I uh, was offered to play the event in 1996, I did it. I thought it was a you know big fun, so. Um, uh, I won in 96, so I was not successful in 1997. I wish I had a chance to play the rubber match, the, the decider, but I retired the computer. So I think at that time, I think I, I still I had a very good winning chance. Yeah, Deep Blue was a powerful machine, but not a match to, to, to modern computers. They are, they are not as fast as Deep Blue, but they're far more sophisticated. So in 97, in 98, if, if IBM had decided to 
play the match. To, I believe I, I would uh, I would be in the position definitely to to do better than in, in the second match. Um, and uh, I always treated this um, competition, man versus machine, as the very important scientific and social experience of the end of the 20th century. So for me, it was again not you know just Gary Kasper versus IBM computer, but uh, a, a way to promote the game of chess, the way to actually to um, to give chess a new, new new level of recognition. And I guess I did it. There's still debates about the correct definition of artificial intelligence. So are we talking about machines copying the way humans making decisions or machines doing something else uh, while reaching the same, the same results? Uh, also, I'm not so sure, I'm, I'm not sure that um, uh, human brains could uh, function separately from human bodies. So because it's all, it's a combination. So we, we, we're still in a learning process about, about our own intelligence. So that's why, you know, to make this, you know, gloom and doom predictions about artificial intelligence without properly understanding how our intelligence uh, functions, I think it's a bit premature. I don't think that humans will become redundant. Politics for people born in, in, in the free world always meant, you know, normal elections, you know, campaigns, debates, fundraising, and other, you know, ingredients of this pro of this normal democratic process. In Russia, it was a different kind of fight. I, I got beaten, arrested, though it happened in the years that you may call vegetarians, because at that time we could spend a few days in jail, five days, ten days in jail. Now, for the same kind of protest, peaceful protest, you could have five or ten years in jail. My very, very close friend and colleague Boris Nemtsov, former deputy prime minister and one of the greatest leaders of Russian pro-democracy movement, has been gunned down in front of Kremlin. It left me speechless because I actually I was here in New York and I just uh, I got a call from one of our friends who's also in exile in, in the Baltics, uh, and uh, he said Gary Boris was shot and I just couldn't believe because it's not just personal relations. Nemso was the man you know it's uh, you know uh, of a great presence you know it was an imposing presence you know he always you know just made his presence known and. Uh, a big voice, a very powerful presence, and uh, and uh, he knew he was his life was in danger, but he was too proud to 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 leave Russia, and uh, he actually gave me an advice in 2013 to leave Russia because he knew I would be in big trouble. Ironically, just the, the, the friend who called me, he also left Russia because of Boris' advice. Boris advised everybody just to protect themselves, and I just wish he could follow you know the same advice and just you know stay alive. If you read enough history books, you know that uh, dictators who, who used to stay in power for a long time, you know, they, they totally annihilated the political space in the country and uh, peaceful transition is, is highly unlikely. I mean, unless they die, uh, uh, as it happened in Portugal or, 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 or Spain, for instance. But naturally, by that time, you know, there were already many... The trend was different because both Iberian Peninsula dictatorships. They moved from repressions to kind of some inclusion of, of different segments. In Russia, it's exactly the opposite. It's more like a Nazi or Stalin's you know, trend, you know, uh, eliminating all the enemies and actually finding more enemies outside of, of the country. So it's, it's, it's like escalation. First of all, I think the, the, the free world must understand that this battle is unavoidable because for Putin, for Iranian mullahs, for North Korean dictators, for all thugs and, uh, uh, thugs and criminals and dictators around the world, fighting against the free world is the, is the main motivation for them staying in power and the way they can, the, 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 the method they can rally public support behind them. Um, and the world is now interdependent. Uh, we live in the, in, in, in the era of globalization. And globalization means that, you know, we bring down the barriers for financial transactions, for trade, uh, for cultural exchange. So for terrorism, 
so for export of, of bad ideas as well as good ideas. And m m even more so, uh, delivering these bad ideas by the modern technologies, you know, the, 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 uh, sp the spread of terrorism and, 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 and radical, uh, radical uh, thoughts, it's easier because they don't obey the rules. So um, this crisis is unavoidable uh, and uh, we'd better do it rather sooner than later. And uh, Europe now is facing another crisis with refugees, just which tells you that, you know, you can't pretend that, you know, what happens in the Middle East doesn't bother you. It does because, you know, people are just coming back and forth and trying to hide from these problems doesn't help. So we'd better use the enormous power of the free world now because free world is much more stronger economically and, and even militarily than, 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 than the opposition. It's not the case of the Soviet Union 40, 50 years ago. And uh, we need just to, re to, to, to find political will. It's about political will. It's about, uh, you know, um, uh, recognition of the general public that we need uh, strong, strong policies to protect our future. If something happens in Russia, or when it happens in Russia, it will not be sort of a peaceful transition, so there will be more of the, more of the chaotic uh, change. And uh, I'll be more than happy uh, to participate in this process, but uh, I'm not making big plans now because, you know, uh, we, nobody knows, you know, how exactly Putin's regime ends. From history, we should probably predict that it will be connected to his uh, failure abroad. So this is one of the geopolitical failures, whether it's Syria, whether it's Ukraine, you name it, will create momentum at home where both Russian public especially middle class in Moscow and the Russian elite will recognize that, I mean, Putin is, is expandable and it's just, it's, it's, it's the price to pay for his, uh, for his uh, rule is simply too high. I didn't want to stay forever in the world of chess, recognizing that my contribution has been just, you know, reducing on the, on the, on the, sta on the uh, uh, steady basis. Um, Oh, when I decided to quit my professional chess career, so I knew that, you know, it would be very unlikely that I could uh, make equal contribution elsewhere, because in chess it was quite a unique contribution. I achieved more than I could dream of. Um, but it was all about making the difference. It's not about, you know, the overall impact. I knew that I could do things, and it was not about winning or losing. It was not about, you know, sort of the size of this impact. That was kind of a moral duty. Plus, I also thought I could do many things by, you know, just writing books, you know, delivering uh, uh, lectures. I didn't want to stay forever in the world of chess. People, of course, remember about my glorious chess past, mm -hmm. but they also know that I'm, you know, I'm chairman of Human Rights Foundation. I've been doing a lot in promoting uh, human rights uh, and democracy, not only in Russia, but elsewhere. I had about 150 appearances in the conferences and the seminars uh, in uh, a different kind of events where I could share my, my views, not only on politics or chess, but also on, 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 on uh, strategy and, and, and decision-making and other important uh, business issues. Look, I always knew that chess was a perfect uh, um, educational tool. It could help kids, especially kids from the uh, underprivileged areas, to um, enter the modern education. Um, it helps them to improve their cognitive skills, you know, their logic, their discipline, uh, to understand the, the, the legal framework. It's not, you know, a solution for all the problems, but it's, it's a perfect tool and it's very inexpensive. I built Kasparov Chess Foundation. It, it's now operating in New York, uh, in, in, in Europe, uh, in South Africa, in Singapore, in Mexico City, and uh, hopefully it will, you know, spread around in more places and uh, countries and continents. I also think that you know this is the it's the educational challenge will be the sort of the one of the greatest challenges of the 21st century because we're dealing with uh, with new realities. So the new new generations they they require new educational um, basis. And, uh, you know, right now we are seeing that uh, uh, classroom is something that has not changed since uh, call the middle of the 19th century. So I believe these changes are imminent and I feel very strongly that chess could play a sort of very positive role in pushing these changes forward. So I believe everybody has, you know, some form of intuition, but uh, people just in the modern world, they, 
they don't want to trust it, so they they want to find more information from the computer screen. We, we're all very you know good in, in in number crunching, while I believe intuition is kind of a muscle. So if you don't train it, you don't trust it, so you don't de develop it. So I always you know knew that you know following my intuition you know could 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 make me fail once or twice, but in big numbers when you just look at the overall in results. Relying on your intuition will make will give you a competitive advantage. I'm I'm cured optimist by nature, so that's why I believe that uh, uh, we'll eventually we'll find a way around just to, to 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 solve all the problems. I okay. Hopefully, I will be I'll be around also in, in 50 years to actually to prove my to to prove that this this prediction was a correct one.